love to welcome up uh, our panel on empowering accessible XR mm -hmm. in the workforce um, with our good friend Elizabeth Hyman from uh, XR uh, Association. So everybody please give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Liz Hyman. It's wonderful to be here, uh, particularly because this is the first time I'm meeting some of the folks that I've been working with all this time uh, in person. So very exciting to be here. I want to introduce our panel. I've got Corinne Weibel from uh, I always, I'm Cadmus Group. <laughs> and uh, also the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Wonderful. And then Joel Ward. Uh, I'm from uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. And uh, Christian Vogler, uh, who is from Gallaudet. Yeah. So do we want chairs? Oh. Oh, for you. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. OK. Great. Tell you what, why don't you get, I'll stand. I'll be the moderator, you guys, so that you're all together, and that way everyone can see you. And I will go from here. <laughs> Is that all right? Okay. Everybody? Sorry. Oh, uh, got it. Everyone comfortable? Everyone good? Okay. Um, great. And just real quick, point of order here, uh, I want to apologize. We did not, uh, it turns out, but quite enough sign language interpreters uh, for this portion of the meeting. Our, our two on staff will be assisting Christian from the front row. Um, so we'll have to ask our folks online to make do with captions for this presentation. So mea culpa, apologies, but please go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, some of us just about a week and a half ago, we're out in Santa Clara, California for the Augmented World Expo, which is one of the larger uh, trade shows and conferences for immersive technologies. And I thought I would make note of that because um, there were a lot of productivity tools there. The way in which people were envisioning the use of immersive technologies was to have computer, virtual computer screens um, to have different training modules for different work activities. And so I thought that just reinforces what many of us have been talking about now for a few years, which is one of the leading edges of virtual and augmented reality is in the workplace. We're seeing these tools being used today, and it makes it so much more important that we're using VR and XR um, and thinking about accessibility tools so that we don't widen gaps. And in fact, um, I was at a, I think it was that panel, and Danielle, who's in the front row here, asked a great question. So it's really nice to see this community come together. So I should say, Liz Hyman, I'm the CEO of an organization called the XR Association. We're an industry trade association. We represent different immersive technology companies uh, from you know, the manufacturers and platforms to enterprise solution providers. And we do a lot of work uh, in creating industry best practices. And we've worked so much with our friends at XR Access. We did a best practices guide um, for developers so that they could develop uh, tools and think about the right way to develop tools to make XR accessible. We all know we have a long way to go. Uh, we took a lot of those tools, partnered with the XR Access uh, community, and created a GitHub. So we're inviting people to add resources and code and, and as much information as possible. So I wanted to. Sorry, I think you're double mics here. Oh. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just start that off. Um, and then maybe what I could do first is just ask folks to introduce themselves a little more fully before we jump into the questions. So, Christian. Why don't I start with you? Could you tell us a little bit about the experiences you've had with XR and where you come from? OK, sure. Hi, my name is Christian Volger. And I work for Gallaudet University. I am deaf myself. I grew up deaf. Um, so I started to become kind of fascinated with the virtual reality systems. And um, so in about the last four or five years, 
I've become immersed in that environment. So I've had a lot of experience researching and studying captions and how that works in a virtual environment. And also, I have a lot of experience playing games myself. So <laughs> that's kind of where I stand with that. Awesome. Joel, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Joel Ward. I, I'm with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, I call myself an emerging technology manager now. Uh, I came from the world of web. So I actually got started with uh, accessibility back in the 90s when the web was new. Um, but over time, I've morphed into working with XR uh, over the past 10 years and um, got real excited about it. And obviously, we're going through the same, some of the same, very same things we went through with the web now with XR, uh, which kind of brought me here. So um, I'm actually now pivoting my career to focus on XR and accessibility. Um, and uh, I'm super excited to, to talk about this with the group today. Because uh, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff we can do with XR, not just to make it accessible, but also to enable accessibility. Perfect. And Corinne? Hi, I'm Corinne Weibel. I'm the co-director of the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. And that's an initiative of the Department of Labor, uh, the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. And uh, ODEP's mission is to close the employment gap for people with disabilities. And our project has the same mission because technology is now part of ev every workplace. Uh, even if the job itself doesn't involve technology, uh, the training might. Uh, things like XR, we're seeing that increasingly, job applications, et cetera. So we work to foster collaborations with employers, with developers, groups like this, uh, to ensure that both current and emerging technologies are accessible by design. Great. So obviously a fantastic panel. Um, so Joel, I wanted to start with you uh, because I think of the perspective that you have from Booz Allen Hamilton, where you're working with just a broad array of clients across different work environments, I guess. Um, and I'm sort of curious what your perspective is, you know, in terms of how they're looking at potentially using XR and what the overlay is from an accessibility point of view. Yeah, sure. So uh, as I mentioned, I came from the world of web and we went through this 20 something years ago. Uh, we've had, uh, so I work mostly, we work with mostly government clients. Um, both DOD and civil and, and across many of the different agencies. Uh, traditionally, we've done uh, simulation work, and that's sort of morphed into XR re more recently, uh, where we do training, right? And so you're taking training that you would normally do either in person or on a computer, right, or a tablet or something, and move it into something that's immersive like XR. Uh, over the past few years, as we've built more and more apps on the more commercially available platforms like the Vive back when that came out in Oculus, um, they've been for much smaller audiences, right? So we've sort of been targeted building things uh, for a very specific set of, of, of people. And the question honestly has not come up as much because we're, again, designing for that small group. And if that group did not include someone with a disability, it didn't come up. And this is, again, kind of familiar from uh, what we had in the past for all other technologies. However, now as the uh, interest in XR is growing, and obviously there's a big interest in the uh, public space, right, with um, it's sort of blowing up a couple years ago with Meta changing their name and sort of things, things are settled down now, but a week ago Apple just announced their new device, which, uh, which they don't call an, a VR device, it's an AR or an XR device. Um, there's interest in a much larger audience and then obviously that, that's when people start to think, oh shoot, how am I going to support a larger audience? So we do get some of those, we start to get some of those questions, how do we do it? Also, do we need to do it? And that's actually an interesting question where uh, we obviously, from a uh, societal standpoint, we need to do this. However, um, if it's not required or if people are not thinking about it, and honestly, a lot of the times they don't even, some, quite often don't even know uh, either that it is a good thing to do or how to do it, then obviously we're not going to do it. So. Uh, what we've been working with uh, both internally and with our clients is one, teaching them what it is, right? And so we, we have people that do Section 508, like web, right? That's nothing new, uh, especially if you're doing work with the federal government, that's a requirement. Um, it's very clearly stated, uh, 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 you know, stated in the Section 508 guidance, that's, that's the law, there's, here's how to do it. Um, we're here in part because there's nothing that really explicitly says it, at least in the the government documents how to do that, even though there are, there's guidance right out there on how to do it. Um, there's still the question: Well, do we need to do it? Um, and you know, if it's on the contract, 
How do we make sure that happens? And that's kind of where we're stuck because working for clients, we're doing what they ask for. We can tell them what is important. We can try to get it in there. But if they're not asking for it, well, I mean, how do you fit it in? Again, that's always the problem with doing the right thing. You know, it's you should do it, but also you need the time and the money to do it. And that's that's where we are now. Just kind of make, making sure that's happening and making sure people understand. Um, so we get to that point where it's just second nature, right? Where, where it isn't yet because we're still learning what we can do with XR. Yeah, and I'm curious in the audience, how many people are familiar with Section 508 procurement? Oh, sorry, I did okay. throw that term out there. Yes. Yeah, no, I just, <laughs> yeah. just yeah. wanted to make sure. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so I say Section 508, but um, if you know what the World Wide Web Consortium are really just accessibility guidelines for, um, for procurement for the government, and it came out of the Rehabilitation Act, and these Section 508 guidelines came out in the, the 90s for how to make applications and websites accessible. And one, it was that you had, you know, you need to do it, and two, there actually were guidelines in the original 508 on how to do it, uh, which were sort of a subset, I guess, of the W3C, uh, WC. Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah, <laughs> World Wide Web Consortium, <laughs> and um, and they've evolved over time. But again, they're clearly stated in the government guidelines, and so that's something we do have here in the U.S. That there are laws and there are guidelines that require it. So there's much less of an excuse just to ignore it. Um, and so we use the term Section 508 just for as shorthand, but it's you know for following those guidelines that um, the world has to actually make websites and applications accessible, which technically also includes XR. But again, if it's not explicitly stated how to do it um, for full XR, that's kind of where the struggle is. And there's also a progression in 508 for emerging technologies. And that's part of the challenge as well, is where are we in the progression of immersive technologies to be able to build these things in from the very beginning? Right. Yeah. So. Um, so current, this is probably a great segue to you because we're talking about government um, and the partnership for uh, employment and accessible technology. If anybody's from Washington, D.C. and knows about acronyms, you always have to take a beat to remember what they stand for. Um, but in any event, uh, we were thrilled to be able to partner with Pete to work on a white paper around XR in the workforce but I'm just curious, can you share a little bit of the perspective of what came out of that paper and also sort of where Pete is in working with immersive tech? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we were also very excited to collaborate on that white paper, which was in 2021. And it's uh, kind of surprising you know, to realize that that already feels like a long time ago in terms of where we all are. Um, so the, the purpose of that white paper, uh, as I mentioned, we work a lot, especially with helping employers understand what's coming in emerging technology and what they need to think about from an inclusion perspective. And so uh, a lot of this uh, was, number one, helping employers understand that XR is not just about video games, right? It's the next computing platform. And that's more clear now, but um, you know, where people were then. Um, I think there's a lot of interest. It was a great time to engage because, of course, the hybrid workplace um, really got accelerated <laughs> in the last few years, quite obviously. And so um, a lot of it was helping employers understand both the potential of XR um, because there's a lot of potential there for the hybrid workplace for people with disabilities, um, which is a complex issue, of course, but, um, you know, they're in so many ways. Um, it, it opens up a lot of opportunities if this works for everybody. Uh, but of course, there's also a big danger uh, when there are new barriers created, uh, when it's you know one size fits all solutions do not work, <laughs> quite obviously. So helping. So this uh, this paper outlines the business case for both um, XR in terms of like so many new opportunities for people with disabilities and other marginalized groups. Um, so in terms of like training, in terms of hybrid work opportunities, um, but also like the, the case for inclusion. And as we have learned uh, from, yeah, the World Wide Web and digital accessibility in general, 
it's so important that as new technologies are deployed, inclusion and accessibility are considered from the beginning. And so uh, the guide really prompts employers to, as they're thinking about these new technologies, to work with disability ERGs that they have, you know, um, to uh, really like communicate a lot with their employees about different needs, abilities, cultural backgrounds, um, and really work with uh, people, but also um, to really involve purchasing staff in these decisions, to really think about the questions to ask vendors, uh, you know, to really get a sense of what their employees need and how to get there. And so, uh, yeah, from there, we've, uh, we've gone on to develop a lot of tools that came out of, you know, the, the work that went into that paper. Uh, we developed an inclusive hybrid work toolkit that uh, offers some more dedicated guidance to employers in this process. And in particular, there's, um, there's a great section we have in there just of questions that employers can specifically ask uh, new vendors about the technology and, you know, with XR and, you know, the questions they should be thinking about. You know, it's interesting. One of the pieces in the white paper, as I recall, uh, was we were talking about opportunity populations. Um, the Chamber of Commerce did some research about, um, you know, disabled and underserved communities have not been included in our workforce traditionally. Um, and, you know, Joel, I'm throwing a little audible here, but I mean, you were talking about how to tell employers, you know, your, your, um, your uh, folks that are hiring you all, like how to think about this thing, like the fact that real-time assists or uh, the ability to, um, you know, be able to repeat a training module over and over or whatever it might be, uh, and then to make the economic case for why it's so important to include people with disabilities in your workforce. I'm just wondering, does that ever resonate with some of the clients that you have? Yeah, well, and, and I'll also say it resonates with the, the company. And that's, that's one of the, uh, the effort that I'm working on now, uh, and we've talked about this, uh, is kicking off a larger uh, accessibility research and development um, effort at the company. Um, and the goal there is to bridge between the, the work that I do or we do on our client side, and I'm on the client side, um, but we also work with our, our internal IT and our internal groups, like the accommodations group and the disabilities uh, business resource group, which I think is mm -hmm. another term for yep. employee resource group or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is that uh, we, we need, one, need to be eating our own dog food, like in doing it, like in making sure we're doing these things. Um, also, uh, for us looking to um, support and hire people with disabilities, and then you know look at how to 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 build those solutions, and then we can also then take that to our clients and vice versa, right? And so um, it, it it all has to work together. It's not like we're just singularly focused on this one thing, um, and um, which is which is exciting because I think what what I found is is connecting the people across both our clients and our client staff. And our internal staff, and I have a colleague here, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> um, is there's a lot of people who are really interested in doing this, and a lot of people, a lot more people, I think, are interested in, in XR in general uh, and accessibility in general. Um, but they're sort of spread out, and so part of it's just making that connection, uh, so we can actually all work together to do this. And that's that's kind of where what I'm I'm trying to get going here because I I think you know it, it's been sort of slow going. Uh, in somewhat, but I think we do have the critical mass to actually move forward. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to be cautiously optimistic about. The fact that all of these conversations are taking place earlier, I think, in the sort of lifespan of the technology. But I also think we have to be clear-eyed about it. And Christian, you know, I, I wanted to come to you to see if you could share with us in vivid detail, you know, some of the challenges that are there for someone, for example, with a hearing impairment. Yeah. Sure, for, so first of all, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, really I'm a huge fan of um, Neil Stevenson's book, um, Snow Crash. <laughs> <laughs> and also I love that movie, A Ready Player One. So um, even though we're going through major growing pains in the field right now, it's just so exciting that we're discussing this at all. 
Um, so the potential is immense, uh, and sign languages are inextricably taking place in 3D space. Now, when we think about workplace training, especially having flat audio and text-heavy 2D videos and materials doesn't cut it for signers. In 2D, anytime you reference a specific entity that you are training on, you introduce both a split attention problem and the problem of localizing the referent properly. For split attention, do you look at the captions at an interpreter or instructor, or at the actual object that you're supposed to learn about. For localizing the referent, if a signer points at something on video, or worse, with an interpreter in a picture-in-picture -picture box, it's hard to, to impossible to determine what you're supposed to be looking at. Having an immersive 3D space could solve this issue in a very satisfying way. The problem will be to get people to use this approach from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't simply translate our best practices from a 2D based approach to an immersive no. environment. So now, moving to my personal experience, I've had three main challenges. Captions, audio cues, and form factor. Most of my experience come from the original PSVR and the successor PSVR2. So now focusing on captions. I've seen a lot of different approaches. It's pretty much a wild west of trial and error out there. But most of what I've seen loosely tries to follow best practices from 2D presentations. That means a caption overlay with some white font on a dark background. maybe with some see-through. It's just plunked over the scenes without consideration for how this interacts with the immersive environment. Now, the result is that I get a massive headache from trying to read some of these captions because they clip through objects or their rendered distance is behind that of an object they overlay, but they still appear to be in front of it visually, which makes it extremely hard to focus my eyes. I mean, I can't even play Star Wars Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, one of the premier titles on my platform for that reason. So I now firmly believe that for any caption that is rendered, it needs to be carefully placed with respect to the z-axis across the entire scene, no matter whether it's rendered in a headlocked way or in the scene itself. Now, Horizon, Call of the Mountain, does this really well, despite its overall lack of caption customization options and using no background. Now, moving on to audio cues. I'll distinguish between audio that is used to enhance immersion, and audio that tries to focus your attention on something specific. So for enhancing immersion, I see a lot of potential in using haptic feedback as a substitute, more so than visual cues. If you wanna convey, for example, that something is big and powerful or dainty and subtle. 
Haptics work great. It's gotten to the point that their absence is jarring and I am starting to consider that an accessibility fail. Going back to workplace for a moment, I also think that these have much potential for not just conveying information about a scene you are training on or expressing tone of voice and volume of someone you are interacting with. Now, for focusing attention. For example, on something that is happening behind you. I'm just dissatisfied with how this is working at present. In 2D, some have used arrows to show directions of audio cues and also use the same mechanism in immersive environments. This doesn't work for me. This might work for some, but it just doesn't work for me. I don't have a concrete answer right now, but as we're starting to see eye tracking integrated with XR, I wonder if we can take advantage of this to guide attention in a more subtle and more accessible way. Mm -hmm. Now, form factor. <laughs> oh boy, I've tried to draw attention to this issue for some time now, and it just doesn't seem to get much attention yet. I am a bilateral cochlear implant user. So sound is transmitted from the processor over my ears to the internal piece under my skin via ultra short range radio. The transmitter attaches to the correct location via a magnet behind and over my ear. And that's right where a lot of hand headbands go for optimal placement of VR equipment. And you need a snug fit so that the equipment doesn't displace from your eyes. So if you're lucky, your magnet will be slightly above or below the main pressure points. But for me, it's right on top. So for extended sessions, I have to take my CIs off, my cochlear implants off, in order to maintain fit, which means I won't hear anything. But if I keep them on, it's a constant struggle of readjusting the headset paired with the magnets, constantly falling off at, a, at slight head movements. Okay. Okay. Now passing the mic back to you. That's great. I think that gives us a pretty holistic view. I know, you know, the WC3 uh, is working on captioning. Um, uh, our organization has been working with a number of different co companies on an accessibility object model. Uh, the hardware, you know, we're trying to see uh, uh, progress. I, I see somebody from HTC who I owe an apology to. <laughs> I didn't return your email. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any event, um, they just won an Augie Award at the Augmented World Expo uh, for their new HTC Vive Elite, which has adjustable ocular um, capabilities. So slowly but surely, things are coming. Um, but it's certainly, you know, we want it to go faster, for sure. Um, but that, again, is a wonderful segue into kind of the last question for this panel. Uh, I'm curious, how many people have tried the Apple Pro Vision? Anybody? No? OK. I haven't. <laughs> I'm dying to get my hands on it. But obviously, that was a big piece of news in the last couple of weeks. I'm curious about the accessibility features in that device. Um, and then I'm also you know, taking stock of the fact that we have a lot of conversation right now that has transplanted some of the hype around the metaverse 
to uh, artificial intelligence and probably with good reason. But I'm trying to figure out from, from all of your perspectives what, what these big announcements mean. So maybe I'll start with, I'll, I'll go Joel, Corinne, and, and Christian. So sorry, Christian, I'm putting you at the end again. That's not fair. But anyways, Joel. <laughs> Last but not least. Exactly. <laughs> so, the best for last. Yeah. The best for last, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I, I think the uh, at some point we'll all get to try the Apple headset, right? The, they've sort of been uh, controlling who's, who sees it. But uh, what, I, what I think is, is important about that is partly it validates what a lot of us have been doing. And honestly, nothing that Apple has done in there is new. Right. If anybody is, here has been working in XR, AR, VR, whatever you want to call it, um, they're bringing it together in this their Apple package, which actually is very nice because that'll make it more available and accessible to people. Um, plus, the, I don't know if you saw, there's, they actually have a, one of the, a couple of the developer videos that talk about the accessibility features. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Um, and they're bringing a lot of the things that they're already doing on the Apple platform. That said, I, I watch it and I think there's a lot still missing because they're focusing on the um, they call it augmented reality, really. It's sort of more of a mixed reality and the sort of desktop product productivity kind of view. Even though it's a VR headset, they never say virtual reality at all because they're not focusing on the immersive part. They're focusing on the presence side of it. And um, honestly, I've, I think a lot of us have, have thought that augmented reality, um, more of a mixed reality versus a pure virtual reality, um, will be the bigger future for all of us. Um, have, you, have you tried these, Christian? No, not yet. If you have time later, I'd like to show you these. So these are the, uh, now they call it X-Real, N-Real glasses. Um, you can actually do a lot of things that Apple does already on these. Um, maybe not quite in the same way, not quite in the same nice package. Um, they're a lot less expensive. You can pair them with the phone you already have or your laptop. Um, what's cool about this is now uh, you can do captioning, right? Instead of having to look down at a phone, which we've been able to do for a while. You can do captioning in sort of your line of sight. Um, you can do virtual desktops and things like that. So again, a lot of this stuff is here. Apple's putting it together into a neater package and getting the, the mind share. But I think that will help a lot of the uh, other companies that are doing hardware, HTC, Meta, uh, even Xreal, um, probably sell and get adoption uh, because it's partly it's less expensive and also maybe more targeted in, in the use cases. And then Apple will continue to evolve They'll get less expensive, and we'll, then we'll all have that. So it's kind of what we've been waiting for, right? Um, is, uh, it's it'll drive some of the developers to create right. content, right? Great. Well, and that's the other yeah. thing that's been missing in VR, because VR has been mostly games. I mean, even though it's more than games, you mentioned, like, <laughs> we, we teach people it's more than just games, but it really has been mostly games. And um, now there's some other use cases that you realize, even just as simple as a, a remote. I, I did this on the train yesterday. I took on the train, I took these, I had my virtual desktop um, with my Mac, and I blacked out my Mac screen so no one else could see it, and I had a virtual desktop. Actually, it was even better with the, the rocking of the train because it was always in my view, right? And so, like, again, you can do this kind of stuff now. People see it, and they're like, well, let, let me try that one thing. And then you know you kind of build on that, so it's that that's more realistic than just diving into like maybe what the metaverse is or whatever the metaverse is supposed to be. We'll get you know the use cases that that's what matters, and then we'll we'll start seeing more of those now that yeah. that there's a, a greater mind share of this in in industry. Yeah, and Corinne, it's not just Apple, right? I mean, Microsoft's getting in on the game too. I think, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think it's it's so exciting to see the technology really going to the place we want it to go. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking about, you know, just to follow that, is that going back to kind of, you know, the lessons of digital accessibility is that, you know, we, there's so often the case now that there's a, an accessible product that it's, it's accessible out of the box, but then it ends up not being accessible because it's been customized or because people have not been trained properly how to use it, you know, um, even if uh, employers implement you know, a, a, a completely accessible um, or as accessible as possible uh, yeah, tool, it's not necessarily going to be accessible in practice if they haven't thought about, um, you know, accessible meeting practices, for example. So, so much of this is employer awareness, you know, from the workplace side. Um, it's, you know, ensuring that, you know, 
there are policies and procedures and staff training um, that the procurement staff know what questions to ask and how to implement it and train. Like those are those are really important piece of this. Um, the other thing I would say uh, is just digital equity in general. Uh, you know, these are fantastic technologies, but it's also still going to matter what the experience looks like on a mobile device or a laptop. Um, like when we're, we're seeing some really exciting things, um, like with VR technologies like transfer being used for workforce development. But of course, that's often in you know, rural communities where broadband speed can really impact things. So, um, so that's another thing to consider. And uh, finally, uh, the digital privacy aspects that the last presentation touched on, I think, are going to be really important, especially as we consider um, employees and job seekers and how their data is collected and used. Um, you know, there there are a lot of ethical in implications around that that um, you know are beginning to be in motion. But uh, it's 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 a big <laughs> it's yeah. a, it's it's a big issue. Yeah. Christian, we said. Yeah, the best for last. Uh, yep. Yeah, I would like to actually talk that say that I'm really actually impressed by Apple and their accessibility. Um, they have really they've thought out their APIs and their develop they've developed materials for promoting the accessibility features of the Vision Pro. However, I do have a couple concerns. I have two concerns specifically. One is that the XR accessibility, like I said, is still like a wild west of learning what works and what doesn't work. So I'm concerned that we're carrying over practices from a 2D world without sufficiently thinking about whether or not they'll work in inversive environments. And if they become cemented, it will be very hard to go back and fix the stuff that doesn't work. And that can be compared to how t uh, TV captioning was set up. We've seen similar things happen with captioning on modern devices because a lot of the shortcomings we have today can directly be tied back to the fact that captioning standards and practices originated from low resolution analog TV. So these poor practices have just been carried forward. Um, and so once they're cemented in, it's hard to make any adjustments. The second concern that I have is form factor. If you, I've looked closely at the availability of pictures and videos and I'm kind of freaked out by it. There's a very good chance that if the fit has to be like in the, to, how the fit has to be set up for how the videos will show, it will cause problems for a lot of cochlear implant users. I've already brought some of this, of, uh, this to the attention of Apple, so I'm crossing my fingers that there is some time that, for them to invest, investigate these concerns and hopefully fix, fix the uh, challenges that I foresee happening. Great. Well, I think we've got to the main part of our panel, but we wanted to open it up for questions um, to the audience. So please, please raise your hand, let us know, and wait for the mic. Uh, there's a question there. Hi, this is Michael Cooper. My question is for Christian. Um, you spoke about the usefulness of haptics in uh, as augmenting captions to describe the environment. Uh, has there been exploration of uh, visual transformations? What do you think about them alongside haptics? I just want to make sure that I understand um, your question correctly. You're talking about visual cues. Is that what your question is about? Yes? OK. So that's actually a really, really great question. I think the problem with visual cues is that a lot of that information will go right over my head. Because I'm deaf, for hard of deaf and hard of hearing people, a lot of these cues, obviously, re they rely on being visual. So in a virtual environment, the visual cues just become very overwhelming and you can't take in everything all at once. So instead, I suggest, like I mentioned, haptics. Um, haptics can give you a lot of information and it's easy to take in for information from different sources at the same time. You know, I just wanted to add to Christian's comment, which is uh, while I, I just recently tried the haptics um, a company has a set of gloves that they were doing a, a demo on, and I played Jenga with somebody about 20 feet away from me, but the, the precision the way in which I was able 
to move a Jenga bar was astonishing. Um, and to have that sense of feel, I played Thumb Wars with somebody 20 feet away. Um, so this type of technology is coming for sure. Also, I wanted to add to that, if you ever feel like it, I strongly encourage you to use the PS5. <laughs> wow. That's all I can say is wow. Um, it's already in 3D. It's, I'm sorry, it's, excuse me, it's already in 2D. So if you add the headset on top of that, I encourage you to just give it a try. <laughs> cool. Uh, I guess right there. Hey, um, uh, also a question for Christian. Um, uh, you mentioned headset fit as a challenge, and I'm curious what a better solution would be um, that's, that's flexible. I noticed that Apple theoretically has a kind of modular solution, and do you see a path from what we saw in their demo last week to adapting that to something that would work for you, and what might that look like? Sure. Um, I don't quote me, but I do have an idea. <laughs> um, I think if there's an adjustment, maybe like a, a rig that can kind of adjust the band um, so it can go around the cochlear implant, I think that would work. Right there. Sheree? Oh, there's the mic right there. Yeah, I have more of a comment than a question. I was really struck by um, Christian describing the visual challenges uh, for people who can see, but happen to have difficulty hearing. And um, yeah, it just made me think that um, the kinds of issues that, so my work is obviously mostly on for people who are blind and low vision, but uh, we think about a lot of the same visual challenges and how to balance out the visual information. And I'm sure that this is something that applies to many other people who are sighted as well, not just people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but maybe people who have um, ADHD or, or other types of disabilities. So just, just making that comment, I wonder if you've thought about that as well. Yeah, I actually agree with you. Um, I haven't considered the specifics on how it could apply to other populations, and I can't speak for other populations and their experiences, but I think it's worth, it's worth it because it can apply to many different populations to have just the options to adjust how you receive information because each person is an individual and they receive information differently. Um, my experience is mostly related to captioning and receiving visual information. And that's because that's just what, how we live as a deaf and hard of hearing person. You know, we're getting 30% of the information from here, 30% of the information from here. So it's not all the same. You know, we're, it would be nice to have options on how we receive that information. And it's important to consider. It's important to figure out how we can show information through various uh, modems and modalities specifically yeah visual visually haptics um there 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 are many different opportunities for that to to just receive information in different modalities and if i can again just add on to that um i mentioned at the beginning our developers guide and one of the things that we put in at the last minute was a chart because each section of the guide was was addressed towards a particular disability but when we put together the chart at the end and we sort of went through it and realized, oh, well, this might be something that is good for somebody who has uh, ADHD, but this also could be helpful, and I'm making this up, uh, for somebody with low vision. So there are different um, techniques through software and through hardware that will have resonance across a number of different disabilities. So. I think that's a, a useful chart. Uh, one more question. I see this gentleman back here. Or, oh, I'm sorry. You already had the mic. I apologize. Please. Okay. Thank 
Thank you. Yep. Um, so I had a quick question also about like the haptics um, that were being mentioned um, because as you mentioned, like the PS5 has a lot of haptics within the controller. Um, the MetaQuest also has haptics within the controller, but with the Apple Vision Pro, I believe it doesn't have any controllers, right? That's one of the features that they're kind of trying to um, talk about, I guess. Um, and I was very curious, like in that kind of a case when there are no more controllers for giving haptics to your hands, um, would that maybe haptic experience take place through the headband then for spatializing audio or indicating spatial audio in yeah. different parts of your head? Or are there any other kind of techniques that could maybe make that more accessible through that vibration? So good point. Um, I think the, the kind of based on the, the last statement too about customization, I think that's what we need is to, whatever Apple's gonna have is not gonna be enough for everybody. It's, I mean, that's obvious. Uh, and we had this with the Holo when the Hololens came out. The same problem. It's all gesture-based. Um, you can add devices to it, but it really was designed to be gesture-based. Um, I'm curious to see the. You can add a controller and a keyboard to the Apple Vision Pro. Um, some of the other platforms you can do that for the PC-based virtual reality. There have been some ability to to do some other controllers, but it, it's sort of been limited. I think that's what needs to grow is the ability to have what you need, and then if you need haptics, like you mentioned, haptics, yes. um, they're one of the one. And there's there's a lot of haptic gloves out there that are inexpensive. Haptics is on the other yeah, end of the spectrum, um, and they're moving coming down in price. And, and haptics, which is it's H A P T X, haptics, um, uses uh, not just vibration but also pneumatic air pressure, and that's sort of the next level of haptics. But there's a lot more that goes into what haptics, um, what, what haptics could provide that we don't have yet with the devices. So back to your original question, partly is I think we need add-ons that don't come with it. Um, but I think also the idea of having maybe whatever you do have vibrate, because like the controllers will do that. Maybe you do add something to the, the headset, right, for part of that. Or maybe you can wear like other wearables, right? And that's actually been done as well for uh, people who are blind. They'll have uh, vibration to kind of tell you where to go. Um, uh, there's a big space, though, that needs to be filled. And that's, I mean, again, sort of partly why we're here. Uh, and I know a lot of work is being done in both academic and in industry to look at that. And then we'd have to like actually take that and, and make it attachable to the platforms that are out there. And that's, that's a whole other challenge, too. So I, does that kind of answer your question? Like, I think it's going in the right direction, but I think we do have a lot of work to do. And I'm curious if you guys have any other comments on that. Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to add that that is actually would be a great idea. You mentioned wear a wearable something for the blind population that would apply to the deaf and hard of hearing population as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all we have time. Can we take one more question from Zoom? It's going to be quick. Um, right here. Uh, sure. I'm looking at Dylan, so he's the boss. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, from Zooms, they ask, what is the device the glasses Joe just showed oh. and discussed? <laughs> so so uh, these are, um, it used to be called Nreal. They're Xreal, X-R-E-A-L, Air. Um, and there's a bunch of other headsets, and a lot of them are out of Asia um, right now, that are pretty good augmented reality, even holographic glasses. And they're in the couple hundreds of dollars range, and they're not full... They're not full headsets like the Quest. They plug into another device, but they kind of give you an idea of what you can do with true augmented reality because these are glasses, not pass-through headset. Yeah, so when X I was Real Air, they're, they're, they, um, they've been on for a couple of years, um, and there's actually some products coming out that are actually integrating this together, so it, we'll see some interesting integrations with this in the coming months and years. Yeah, and when I kicked off the panel, I was talking about a number of different vendors at AWE that had similar type products and approaches to productivity tools is how I would put it. There's but a lot yeah, of, these use the waveguides, and there's a lot of companies that are making the what are called waveguides, which are the, basically the um, the screens where the projectors can project in a small space, so it looks like it's holographic versus a vir virtual reality headset is a screen in front of you, right? Stereoscopic, two screens that make it feel like you're um, in a virtual space. It's much harder to do with a pair of glasses. And so what I'll tell you is these, the, the field of view on things like this are maybe 50 degrees versus a VR headset is 100 degrees or more. And the dream is 100 and what, 80, 200 degrees. So you can actually, like real life, you have periphery vision. So you're not gonna get the same field of view out of this, but you, the cool thing is you can 
interact, like I mentioned the caption, so I can talk with somebody and it can give me captions or even translate for me without having me look down at a phone, right? So things like that are really powerful use cases right now that you can do with stuff like this. Great. I know there are other questions. I want to thank Corinne and Joel and Christian for a wonderful conversation. And hopefully during the break, if there are additional questions, you'll all be able to ask the experts. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much to our panelists here.